G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so good to see you. We're out on the Fuji X-H2S and it is so good to be here joining you for this episode. And right now we're shooting with the 30mm 2.8, which of course with an APS-C crop takes us out to 45mm. We're shooting in 6.2K open gate in F-Log2 on the Fuji and we're using the on-camera mics, 24 frames. How's it looking? We will be putting a grade on this because it's extraordinarily flat when you're straight out of the camera. All right, let's shoot. Uh, we've got some other lenses as well, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. And we can definitely see here that the Fuji is stabilized, except when I fall off the footpath like it just then. Alrighty, we are starting off with the XF 30mm f2.8 LMWR macro. As we can see here, the handling of flare and the handling of this high dynamic situation looks great. Now we're shooting on the X-H2S, which comes with all these different types of profiles and these are curves within the profiles. I'm not 100% sure if Capture One is working with Fujifilm on this or this is their interpretation of those in-camera profiles. We are working in RAW on the X-H2S, which is a 26 megapixel stacked sensor in APS-C. The first, Sony has just put out the 6700, which is a BSI sensor, but by the look of it, it doesn't appear to be a stacked BSI sensor. They are both 26 megapixels. We are shooting here in base ISO at night time, one tenth of a second, f2.8, which is fully wide open on this lens, 30 mil, which is 45 millimeters field of view equivalent. As usual, I like to push into the scenarios that I like to shoot in, and here we are at one second ISO 80 f2.8 30 millimeter handheld on the X-H2S. Now, one second, it sometimes worked, it sometimes didn't. There is a very slight amount of camera shake. I have theorized whether IBIS units are as good vertical as they are in landscape. This is an observation that I've made and theorized. I do not have any conclusive ideas around that. Just to be clear on what I'm saying here is I wonder whether in-body image stabilization mechanisms are more calibrated for landscape than portrait. And there's probably also something around the physics that when you're in portrait mode, you've got a longer surface that's moving and if you're tilting up and down because of gravity, then there's a longer area that has to be compensated for than if you're in landscape. So there's more pressure on the IBIS unit when you're in portrait mode. This is because of gravity, and that makes sense to me. I still think this is a pretty good result considering we're almost at 50 mil field of view equivalent and it's one second handheld. A slightly shorter amount of time, just slightly. I think we can see here that it's doing a slightly better job. If we look around the frame, the sign here, the wire here, and other areas, these trees are probably slightly moving in the breeze. Just changing it that slightest amount is actually making a difference. And we're still very close to one second. Looking at chromatic aberration, fringing and flaring, it seems to be controlled pretty well. And we look in this area here, photons to photos, dynamic range chart for this camera, it is around 10 stops of dynamic range. One thing I've found interesting about the X-Trans sensor that's in this camera, which is the opposite, say, of Nikon and probably Sony as well, it appears that this sensor is better at looking into the highlights, whereas the Nikon and Sony sensors, I think, are better at looking into the shadows. And that's just how the sensor is calibrated. I'm sure there's some logic around that, and there's probably some very experienced Fuji users who know more than I do as to why they might be doing that and how it helps with your images. That's just an observation I've made looking at these files. You seem to be able to dive deeper into the highlights, not so deep into the shadows. You still can dive into the shadows, as we can see here, but there's just not as much information there. So that, that to me is just a choice on where they're choosing to set the center point of each ISO, because that is just a choice that the manufacturer can make when putting the camera together and saying this is 64, but it can actually be a bit of a spectrum as to where they choose to do that. Color rendition and sharpness 
is looking great. Of course, we're APS-C. I'm very used to shooting on the Z8 and the Z9 these days. There's more information. You've got almost twice the pixels in those cameras. So we just can't expect to see the same outcomes. Half a second, ISO 80. I think we're pushing the friendship here a little bit when it comes to stabilization. We are vertical again. If you're a tourist or you're a night photographer, you're walking around, you're trying to get this sort of stuff. This is a great result considering how hard I am pushing camera and lens in a high dynamic range situation. We can see up here with this sign, chromatic aberration seems to be suppressed really well. Quite a high dynamic range situation here. This is a one second exposure. Looking pretty good. Have a look at the pizza store. It is it is able to bring down that highlight. There is almost no adjustment to this file straight out of camera, number one. Number two, ISO 500. This is where the dual gain seems to happen. I think that's a very clean looking file for this sort of ISO. Half a second is looking solid, f2.8. You're walking around your own city, you're doing streetscapes, nightscapes. At 100%, looking at chromatic aberration, it looks good. I'm really happy with this outcome. I, th I think it's a great result considering everything that's going on here. We've got the 60mm 2.4. How cool is that? Times 1.5. So this is a 90mm. So it's a little bit like using an 85mm 1.8, except it's a 90 2.4. Close. Not quite the cigar. The beautiful 14mm that we're shooting on here. This glorious cityscape. Now let's see, we are at half a second handheld. Can we get away with it? I do think the IBIS unit on the X-H2S is pretty good. One tenth of a second, plenty stable enough. F2.8, we're wide open. This is looking sharp, crisp, colors are very accurate. We're back at one second and we can see we're pushing the friendship again here with camera shake. It's perhaps shaking a little bit more towards the edges Certainly in this corner here, we're losing things a little bit. One of these is perhaps my favorite shot of the evening. And in another video, we'll take a look as I squeezed off a shot of this with the Z8 as well. Hadn't planned on pulling the Z8, but I just wanted to see, because this was kind of a pretty difficult shot. You can see we're shooting at one second or half a second. There's actually two different lenses here. There's the 30mm and there's also the 60mm. The 60mm 2.4 Super EBC lens. One second, handheld, base ISO, a little bit of manipulation over here on the left, not very much. At one second, at 100%, this one is a little tiny bit soft. Here on the wall where I would say critical focus is somewhere around here. I still think one second is probably pushing the friendship a little bit too much. I think Z9 have continued to be tweaked when it comes to the IBIS unit getting better and better. This camera is pretty new to market. I think the IBIS unit will continue to be tweaked. There is potentially an opportunity that this camera will get even better. But what I'm saying here is if you want to be super safe, shoot around a quarter to half a second and a second based on the firmware which I was using, which was version 1. IBIS units can be continually updated and improved. There will be physical limits at some point in time. The result of quarter of a second or half of a second is very good. Half a second here now on the 60 mil at 2.4, so we had a tiny bit more light. We're at half a second, 2.8, handheld, and seeing how these things go in the dark, which is how I like to work. And I think we're pushing the friendship a little bit too hard at this point in time. Now I was checking out whether there was a dual gain on this sensor. There appears to be dual gain, a slight dual gain around 640 ISO, maybe 500 ISO. Uh, the other thing I noticed is um, we have 10 stops of dynamic range. Of course, this is an APS-C sensor and they're cramming 26 megapixels into this APS-C space. Be interesting to see what the dynamic range is on the, um, the X-T5, which is coming soon. 90mm field of view equivalent is an interesting focal length to be working at at night time, handheld in a big city. But I love this sort of stuff. Got no problems shooting 85 at 1.8. This is just slightly slower. It's not, it's something like half a stop's difference. So, uh, yeah, it's looking good so far. The last lens we'll be playing with is a 
Was it a 90? What was it? An 80. It was a 90 or an 80. That'll be next. That'll be pushing the Friendship up out to something like 120 mil. But it does have OIS, optical image stabilization, which neither of the first two lenses have. Well, here we're getting a chance to see the lovely bocaliciousness of this lens, getting the wall in focus here and Chinatown out of focus. Looks lovely. It looks super soft, super smooth, silky, silky smooth, that out of focus area. Yet we can see here that the stone wall is very sharp. That is a very pleasing outcome from the 60 mil. Pretty impressed with how this turned out because we are at one third of a second handheld and I'd be pretty happy with that level of sharpness considering things are blowing in the wind as well. Flare, chromatic aberration appears to be suppressed very well. So of course these are macro lenses. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get up here to this pumpkin cake. Get right up close, see how close we can get. Macro. Oh wow. That's it. That's pretty that's pretty pretty uh this is testing out the macro capabilities of the 60 mil that's pretty much as close as i could get we're at 1 50th of a second and i was moving this is handheld extraordinarily difficult to get this right handheld one third of a second handheld on the 60 2.4 at a third of a second this is probably impossible to keep still so what I'm going to do is crank the ISO to 500, which is where I think the Jill gain is. There we go, and push the shutters to a 15th and hope that's fast enough. Let's go to a 30th. Still feels like I'm moving too much. Let's take a look. Uh, it's good. It's good. It's good. Good, good. All right. You've got to make it work for you. That's what you've got to do. This was a poster in a laneway. Beautiful color rendition, very accurate. One third of a second handheld. This is beautiful. It's nighttime and we're just using the ambient light. This looks like it could be lit during the day. Then coming in as close as we can get on the eyeball, one thirtieth of a second, ISO 500. You're not seeing grain here. You are seeing the dot that is printed to make this picture. Got to do the beer keg test. It just has to be done. ISO 500, one sixth of a second. Still very, very slow on a 90 mil field of view equivalent lens. This looks sharp, beautiful rendition, texture, depth, colors, very good. We might be seeing the tiniest amount, tiniest amount at the back here of green fringing, but not distracting, very, very minor. Handheld, one tenth of a second, F2.5, OSI 500. And down there, ballers. That's pretty ballsy to call your shop ballers. Now, something I found interesting about the Fujis is they don't, they don't have a flat profile. Now, I've spoken to Ray, Ray Parker, Raymond Parker, my dear friend in the west coast of Canada, and Ray ha has had a lot of Fuji cameras over the years. And I said, Ray, is there a flat profile anywhere in your Fuji? And he said, no no flat profile. So I'm shooting with Velvia, which was one of my all time favorite films, Transparency, or Tranny film as I used to like to call it, uh, back in the day. Super colorful, it's a little bit contrasty, it seems to be this version. I'm, I'm not sure it really looks like Velvia, but that's what I've got on, even so we can go to Capture One and sort of change all of that stuff. Ultimately, my point is, Fuji, I'd love a flat profile, just like you have your your F-log profiles, your Fuji logs, which are super flat. Give me a flat profile uh, for stills. Just so I can see more of the dynamic range of the situation when I'm shooting. That's why I actually want to see it. So I can see a bit more in the shadows. A lot of these profiles are quite contrasty. Just a thought, just a little thought. You could call it Flelvia, flat Velvia. Next, coming from Fujifilm, thank you very much, I'm getting the X-T5, which I'm really excited to look at because it's 40 megapixels in an APS-C size sensor. That's cool.
Whilst we were out shooting, we met this young man who was very interested in what we were doing. We found out that he is just about to finish his accounting degree, along with him being a rapper. And he offered to just rap for us. I photographed him in extraordinarily low light conditions, rapping. He was moving very quickly. We are at ISO 1600. This is a great look for ISO 1600. At 1 125th of a second, that was almost the minimum to keep him still. And we're at 2.4 on the 60 mil. Considering how difficult these lighting conditions were, I'm pretty pleased with the results. Check that out, ISO 1600, 1125th, f2.4. Great depth of field as well. Very sharp, very clean for 1600 ISO. Now we're at 100th of a second. Straight out of camera with the generic XH2S profile and we can go to auto. We can choose things like Velvia, throws a bit more color our way. I love these paste ups. They give us a real sense of how sharp these lenses are. Plus we can see the out of focus bokeh areas as well. I think this is a great result at ISO 500, one thirtieth of a second handheld at f2.4 at 90 mil field of view equivalent on the 60 mil macro. Beautiful colors, very minor adjustments we can see here with this file. It's a great result. Different color temperature on this one. I think I like the color temperature on this better. Love the dynamic light of the motorcycle behind. Again, I think it's a great capture. We can see here around the lens a little bit of aberration, perhaps a little bit of flaring. There we go. Yeah, nice, 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 nice. Gotcha. Resetting this back to straight out of camera, and we can see this area here is actually blown out. There is no information right there. But if we do a little bit of highlight recovery, and there is all of that information. So that's what I'm talking about. And we can bring that exposure down a little bit more, and there's even more information there. I do think the Fujis lean towards having more information in the highlights and less information in the shadows, as I mentioned before. Oh, Joe, check that out. Oh, that's a pearler. Pearler, my pearls. And that's fine. It's not a pro or a con. You just need to know how to work with your camera. That's all there is to it. You need to know what your camera is best at, and then you shoot accordingly. And as I found with my Nikons for years and years, they have extraordinary shadow recovery, but not as strong in the highlights. I shoot for the highlights. Here, we can perhaps shoot more for the shadows. For nighttime shooting, the ISO 500 seems to be a great place to be. This is just a standard city with standard sort of lighting, and we're at 1 20th of a second here. And this is just a really normal, great outcome possible for any type of photographer to use. Women's World Cup of Soccer starting here in Australia, and this is the Australian team projected onto the front of our major train station. Looks pretty cool. The colors are really accurate. ISO 500, 1 20th of a second, f2.4, 60 mil. And if we look here at the stained glass, that's, a, that's just a lovely, a lovely and very accurate capture at 100% pixel for pixel. We can see a little bit of chromatic aberration going on here in the clock. I think that's what we're seeing there. One sixth of a second ISO 500, 2.4, nice capture, focuses on the staircase. The tower in the background, which is probably almost a kilometre away, is out of focus. We've just had an amazing dinner at Lucy Lou, and if you're ever in Melbourne, you've got to come down here. Interestingly, Peter McKinnon made this sign famous by having a competition where he said, take a photo of something red, and someone took a photo of this, which pretty much everyone in Melbourne's taken a photo of this, and they won the competition, which is pretty funny. Anyway, we are now on the 80 millimeter 2.8, there it is there. How cool is that? It's a 2.8. It has optical image stabilization and it is so stable. So we're out at night. Here we are. We're shooting at a 50th of a second because that's bright and it is very, very stable. <laughs> it definitely feels like to me that the optical image stabilization along with the in-body stabilization, they're working together because it's so stable. We're going to finish the night with a few images from this. It's been so good with the Fuji film. Alrighty, X-H2S and a whole range of very gorgeous lenses. Lovely, I think I fell out of the side of frame, did I? <laughs> no, all good. That was good? It's so wide.
At this point, we've changed to the 80 millimeter, which is a 120 millimeter field of view equivalent. It's a 2.8, but does have VR in it. ISO 500, 1 20th of a second. This is where we had dinner. This is a close up of that neon, and it's extraordinarily close up. It's just one of those little bars. Straight out of camera with Capture One's generic settings, we can push it in all sorts of directions and make different things happen here. Shadows up, highlights down, more of the neon information, but we're driving those shadows pretty hard. And I, I do think they don't behave in the same way a Nikon file would behave, but we're getting way more in the highlights. Interesting. I think I've pushed things too far there, but it's an interesting result. And it looks good, very sharp. The ISO 500 is a bit like the ISO 640 on the Z8 and the Z9, where it's really not very, it doesn't feel very different to the base ISO. This was an example of where I've pulled up the shadows and down the highlights. And it's a great result because this is an extraordinarily bright backlit sign from Chanel. Very sharp, 1 25th of a second ISO 500. Did manage to squeeze in a little bit of daytime here and the lenses and renditions look really lovely. There's absolutely nothing you can complain about here. And the only thing that you might want more of, and that's why we have the X-H2 and the X-T5, is pixels. Those cameras are 40 megapixels. Otherwise, based on what this is, I think it's rendering super well. Again, this is the 30mm, which is 45mm field of view equivalent. Base ISO, one two and a half thousandth of a second at f3.6. And it just shows how sharp these cameras and this lens can be. We're at f2.8, one one thousandth of a second. On the focal point. Well, we've had a great day and evening with the 30, 60 and 80 mil lenses for the Fuji X mount, the XF mount on the X-H2S. We've seen some amazing images as well as some video. And I'm really looking forward to getting the X-T5 and some even faster prime lenses to test out on both the X-H2S and on the X-T5 because it is a 40 megapixel APS-C camera. Please let me know in the comments, what do you think of the Fuji, the Fuji lenses? These are both great macro lenses as well as we can see here, great primes. When you've got 2.8 or 2.4 of light gathering, you can still get away with what we're doing here, which is street and travel. And of course these cameras well, as we worked out tonight, they're not exactly a whole bunch smaller, but they're a little bit smaller, and in some cases, they're lighter, which makes them great travel cameras. Now, of course, this is one of the heavier Fuji X-mount cameras, the X-H2S, which is one of their flagships because it is a stacked sensor, but there are much, much lighter cameras in the range. Please let me know what you think in the comments below and I look forward to seeing you soon. And if this is your first time here, you know what? I'd love to see you again. So please do subscribe, please share, and please like, and bye for now.